Hello everyone, I'm Ruben Ruffel and thanks for joining me tonight together with uh, you cook. I'm really looking forward uh, to showing you my dish tonight. There's a lot of surprises. Um, and so I just want to say thanks for joining us and all of this is done in aid of supporting uh, the staff at my restaurant. So I just want to say thanks for your support. So we've got a, quite a lot to go through. Um, so a few ingredients that I want to get ready before we get into the full recipe of cooking the rice. So um, let's get stuck into it. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, Ruben. I'm sure everyone at home is very excited to get cooking. Can you tell us a bit more about the dish that you're going to be making? Well, Nick, um, I'm a, a big lover of risotto. Um, you know, I, I think the first time I cooked it, I obviously first read up about it a little bit. And, you know, I think like many people initially, you think it's quite a simple way of cooking rice. <laughs> but it, it's, it's, it's one of those type of recipes, or risotto specifically, that, you know, the more you do it, the, the better you get at it. And um, my dish is kind of, it's a, it's a vegetarian winter risotto. I'm using what's in season, so these beautiful sort of um, rainbow beets, different colors. It's not just about the color. It's obviously a bonus that they look so great, but they taste stunning if you roast them. And I'm serving that um, with a bernoisette, so brown butter um, that's flavored with sage and these uh, lovely walnuts. That is obviously a good combination with beetroot, but to give it an extra boost, we're also adding gorgonzola. And then I'm serving it with um, a, a rocket salad. So kind of like a, a, it sounds pretty simple, but you know, there's a few steps that we have to get right to make it, to make it perfect. Those of you who are cooking at home, you're about to master a risotto with Master Chef's own Ruben Riffle. So I hope you are all ready. Um, are ready to get started, Ruben? Yeah, I'm ready. So I'm going to start with uh, cooking my beets. So I've got some boiling water going here. Um, so I just want to cook the beets. I'm doing it whole just to soften them slightly. So I'm cooking it two ways. They're going to be first uh, boiled and then afterwards they're going to go into the oven to give them a nice roast and also to intensify that flavor. Okay, so they're going to go straight into my pot of boiling water. And the thing with uh, rainbow beets, they don't really cook as long as, um, you know, the normal beets that uh, we've been used to over the, year, uh, over the years. They cook, these cook much quicker, they soften much quicker as well, and they're way sweeter. So, yes, you can use them like you use normal beet, whether you want to pickle them or whatever, but um, just be mindful of that, that they, they do quick, uh, cook much quicker. And these rainbow beets that customers would have received in their boxes, as you mentioned, they're not the usual beetroots we grew up with. Um, we've got a question from Anya who would like to know, why are some beets red and others yellow? So it's a, it's a different type of cultivar. Um, uh, so again, they, they're completely different to the beets that we know. Um, and these rainbow beets um, are just, you know, they have these different sort of colors, but they all taste the same. You know, they've got that sweetness. The one, I mean, there's an interesting dish that I had in a restaurant, uh, I remember way back, where the chef ex actually served uh, orange sorbet and like a, a, a beetroot sorbet. And back then I didn't know yellow beets existed. And I got sort of like this orange uh, sorbet uh, that tasted like beetroot. And then uh, the red sort of sorbet that tasted like orange, which kind of like messed with my mind. That was the first time I was introduced to it. And I mean, I've loved them ever since. For those of you watching at home, please send your questions in via Facebook, uh, Instagram, or YouTube, wherever you, you are choosing to watch. And Ruben will answer them as we cook. But I think we're ready to really get stuck in now. We've got a bit of multitasking ahead, don't we, Ruben? Yeah, look, I mean, you know, that's the nice thing when... You know, when, I, when you cook in a restaurant, obviously there's a lot of stuff happening. Uh, with risotto, at the end, there's so many things that you need to get together to, uh, because the risotto is one of those dishes that you finish it off. It's almost like pasta. When you start adding the cheese at the end, 
you gotta it, you gotta start eating it. You know, it can't sort of like stand and wait. That's why. Let's do some of the work now. I'm gonna start chopping um, my walnuts. So I don't want to chop them too fine. It's just like a rough chop, we call it. I mean, you don't really need a hell of a lot of skill here. Um, because, I mean, I don't, obviously, when it comes to nuts, and especially in this case, the walnuts, I'm after the texture as well as the taste. So I don't want kind of like too fine. So that should be enough. Okay, and then just to pick our sage, uh, because we want the leaves, you know, and the, the, the nice thing about them, once we start to make our brown butter, they go really nice and crispy, um, which makes the taste great, but also gives another element of texture, which is also great when you, when you sort of, you know, when you cook certain dishes, I think what we love about it is not just the taste, but the mouthfeel, you know, and texture is an important thing when it comes to food. Okay, so I think that should be enough. I'm making enough for two. Um, and this is kind of like enough of almost a little bit too much almost. But anyway, I've got it done. Then I just quickly want to rinse my rocket. While you're rinsing your, your rocket, Ruben, we've got a question coming in from Instagram saying, nice knife, what make is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a Japanese um, knife. It's, the company is called Kaishun. And these guys, like many of the knife makers now in Japan, they used to make swords, samurai swords. And um, yeah, I love these. They also look great and they, I mean... I'm a bit of a knife collector. I collect these. I've got quite a big selection at the moment, and it's still growing. So, but this is a great company, and they are available in South Africa. But I also want to add, there's some local guys making amazing knives as well, which is, I mean, it's just getting better and better. Okay, so get my cutting board clean, and then I'm going to start with my onion. Now, like I mentioned, I'm making enough for two. This onion is quite big, so I'm not going to use the whole onion. I'll put that to the side. Is onion something that traditionally goes into a risotto? And, and what, what does it add to the flavor or the mouthfeel that you were describing earlier? Yeah, look, I mean, there's many of our recipes that calls for the use of onion. Uh, especially in the beginning. Now, what does that bring? I mean, sometimes we just cook, and I'm sure we, a lot of us ask that question as well, but the reality is the onion adds that sweetness, doesn't it? I mean, when you cook it properly, it does add uh, that flavor, but the, if you sort of cook it, and in our case, we're going to sweat the onion, so sweating also, you know, it's a slower pr process of cooking it, so uh, it brings out the sweetness of the onion. That really goes well. It's a natural sweetness that goes well with the with the risotto and the flavor of the risotto. So I chop it a little bit different. I want it to be kind of fine, but not not too fine. But the idea is that it kind of like melts into the rice. Okay, that should be enough. So time to get my pan on. I have to mention this too. I mean, the reality with um, cooking risotto, there's a few things. I mean, you have to have the right pan. You know, like this one, it's got a nice thick base, which is important. Um, you don't want a pan where the rice starts to stick to the bottom of the pan. Um, and you want a pan that if you reduce the temperature, some of the thin based pans, if you reduce temperature, it's not immediate enough where I find these thick based pans, they just work so much better. Okay, I'm going to get my garlic ready as well. So I'm going to grate it and I'm using a microplane. Now I know, you know, I'm also, I love sort of just using my knife and, and uh, 
displaying uh, to the kind of like display my uh, knife skills. But here I want the kind of like the garlic also to melt into the risotto, so I don't want it to. Um, I don't want it to be big pieces. You can also crush it and chop it really fine, but that's that's fine. So I'm going to use my microplane. So at this stage, you've got to be careful because you don't want to be grating your fingers. And the microplane works really well. Let's just get that a little bit off there. This almost creams the garlic. I mean, I love using the microplane when it comes to grating or, I mean, like I mentioned, you can chop it. Grating it this way is just so much nicer, especially, and it works beautifully with the with the risotto, and I'm not like one of those people that don't like the flavor of garlic. I love garlic. Don't know about you guys. For everyone at home who, who's busy chopping their garlic at the moment, would it be okay to use a, uh, your standard sort of box grater at home? Um, yeah, but it comes with extra caution, and you've got to use the finest uh, sort of uh, side of it. But yeah, just... Um, a microplane, I find, it's very difficult to cut yourself on these. Where box graters, you have to be a bit more careful. Safety first for everyone Safety watching first, at home. For oh, sure. yes. <laughs> Ruben, while our, while our beets are boiling, um, people may know you from MasterChef South Africa. They may own one of your cookbooks at home. But could you maybe tell everyone a bit more about Ruben's and how you started your restaurants? So Ruben started about, um, it's now 17 years ago, a long time. I was, uh, so I'm from Franschhoek, I'm from the town there, and I was lucky enough to, uh, over the years, as, as a very bad waiter, I was, I mean, that was my first job in the restaurants, uh, but I, was, uh, I wasn't that great at it. And then I was, I was quickly sort of promoted into the kitchen, and um, that's where also, not just my love of cooking. Um, it was like a live show, basically. And then, over the years, I, I met some great people along the way, um, which then, uh, you know, once I moved uh, to the UK, came to see me there and offered sort of like for us to be partners in opening our first restaurant. That was the first Rubens back in the day in 2004. Um, and yeah, our idea was to kind of like change the way things were done in Franschhoek at that stage. So easy, um, easy cuisine. Kids were sort of, um, I mean, uh, there was quite a lot of fancy restaurants at that stage where kids weren't even allowed. And we wanted to just do something more simple, a bit more modern, um, uh, with a great design space, basically. And I mean, yeah, that was 17 years ago. Okay, so I'm going to start my pan for the risotto. And I think my beets are almost done. So when it comes to making risotto again, we did discuss the pan, but um, the onions, we don't want to color them. I don't want to get, so sweating is basically just you're cooking them until they're nice and soft uh, before the rice goes in. Um, so temperature is important. Start with low temperature. Um, and also, I always say you don't need to keep on adjusting. I, I sometimes pull the pan off and then it goes back. Um, I think that sort of like works very well for me instead of just constantly uh, kind of like adjusting your temperature. But my beets are done. So I'm just going to drain them quickly. Oh, there's my spoon. I did mention they cook very quickly, so they just slightly soften at the moment. So I just want to drain them. Because the idea is we want to roast them in the oven. So, you know, we I don't want too much of that excess water on there, so I just want to drain that off. And I'm going to roast them whole. So... Part of the reason why I do that is because you want to, you know, you want them to retain all that nice sweetness inside. I'm keeping the skins on. Uh, you know, you've got to wash them and rinse them properly to get rid of all that bit of grit that's in there. And I've done that prior. 
Um, and also another thing is I don't let me get my lappy. I don't add too much oil into my roasting pan because the idea is you want to roast them. So it's like a combination of dry roasting and with a little bit of oil that sort of goes with that flavor of the beets. So it's just salt and pepper and some oil that I'm going to add. I mean, already these beets are looking amazing. I'm sure a lot of people at home aren't used to cooking with such a whole vegetable. I think they're the perfect size too. Um, and, you know, it's very seldom that you get them much bigger than this. I think sometimes when they're much bigger than that, they, they're actually coming to the end of their season and they're not that great. So this size, they're still pretty nice, pr nice and sweet, which is how we want them. Okay, so my oven was preheated to 200 degrees Celsius. Beats goes in. Okay, so I'm going to quickly add my onions to the pan so we can start sweating them. So once again, you know, check your temperature. I'm going to increase it slightly, not too much. Um, and when it comes to stirring for your risotto, I would recommend using a wooden spoon. You know, when I started to make it the first time, I had a, an Italian chef that said to me, if you use a metal spoon and if you stir too fast and too vigorous, you don't want to break the, especially when the rice starts to soften, you don't want to start break, breaking the, the rice uh, kernels. Um, so yeah, use a wooden spoon if you can. If you've got a wooden spoon at home, make sure you've got it out. Um, got some questions coming in now, Ruben, if you're happy to answer some from some of our home cooks. Um, one from John asking, who inspired you to be a chef? Um, you know, I think my mom introduced me to, uh, to great food, but it was really when I started to meet chefs that displayed another sort of like passion when it came to food. You know, the, uh, I always say to young chefs, you can talk about passion um, for food, but the reality is you also, in our game, you have to have a passion for the industry and working in a kitchen together with a team uh, as part of the team. That's a whole different passion. And I think I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the, the camaraderie and uh, kind of like the team effort. And uh, my first chef that I really enjoyed working with was a chef called uh, Richard Carstens introduced me to cookbooks from other chefs from all over the world, kind of opened my eyes to what's possible when it comes to cooking. So speaking of cooking and working in a team, um, the news of the lockdown obviously hit the whole industry hard. And I'm sure a lot of people are curious to know how you dealt with it, how your staff felt, and, and what's happening now. Yeah, so our restaurants are still closed at the moment, you know. I mean, we... Uh, we were planning and still talking in terms of when we can open, when we can get going. But yeah, I think uh, it's obviously impacted uh, our industry massively. Um, uh, and, you know, our industry employs a lot of staff, a lot of people are involved in, in our businesses. So in our case, uh, we have in Franschuk, we have uh, three restaurants. And um, the biggest thing for us is obviously the people. It's the, the people that's been with us, our family, that's been with us from day one, working with us. And, um, you know, a lot of them obviously also have their dependents and them sitting at home, not really getting any answers of what's coming or where we're going to go. I think that's the, probably the most frustrating thing. Yes, I think we all try and sort of like still help out where we can. But yeah, it's been devastating. Um, uh, I think uh, every day that goes by, because this is such a dynamic thing, you know, the goal, goalposts sort of like are changing all the time. And we have to sort of like rearrange our planning in terms of when this thing is going to, uh, well, I hope it's going to be gone soon. I think we all hope for that. But yeah, it's, uh, it's been really bad for, for especially our, our staff, 
Um, so I feel for them, you know, I mean, we do many things to keep them going, whether it's food parcels or these type of things, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think they also want to help themselves. And to those watching at home, tonight is your chance to help out if you can. We will be putting a snap scan code up during a quick break in the middle and at the end of the You Cook Along, but you can find it in your box or on our social media. So, Ruben, where are we with our, with our onions? Okay, so my onions... Sweated nicely, soft. Rice is gonna go. Rice is gonna go in, and then also my garlic. Okay, so and the temperature. Let me just clean it up here a little bit. And um, as you can see, the temperature is still fairly low. You know, um, I. We'll increase it a little bit once we get the stock going. So speaking about the stock, um, I boiled some water earlier, so I just want to mix my stock quickly. So While we we've got the, the stock going, Kath would like to know if the lockdown period has inspired any new recipes for you. <laughs> I think um, the reality to... The lockdown, it's kind of like, it's kind of like made me think of, or made me get out of my sort of, uh, not that I was afraid of um, sort of social media or cooking kind of live, but I've started to do more of these type of things. And normally it's the simplest, the simpler type of recipes that we're doing, you know, so things that, Yes, I love making babuti, but I haven't made it in a long time, so you start to make that again. I remember the first traditional dish I made, you know, because I think the lockdown came just before Easter, so it was pickled fish and all these type of things. But yeah, um, I mean, I'm constantly working on new things, but uh, for us, kind of like part of something I'm look looking forward to once we get going is that you can, you make a clean break, you start something new. So out of this can can, you know, something good can come out of it as well. So yeah, there's a few, um, but they're still a work in progress. So nothing that's definite yet. Okay, so just I've got, this is a vegetarian um, risotto. So I've got some veg stock that's going to go in there and I just want to mix it. So also important that you make sure that the stock that you add to your risotto is warm because you know the rice just cooks completely different if you start adding cold stock to it the, the, the stock needs to heat up and then it only gets absorbed by the rice so just be careful when it comes to that just need to get rid of this pot okay so the other thing about the risotto also we're not like it's not like boiling normal rice so once you get your temperature perfect, and I mean, I'll, I'm going to check this one now. It might be a little bit too high, but what you want to do is you want to cover the rice, uh, allow the rice to absorb the liquid, the stock, then you add more. And then over during that whole process, you want to see some boiling, but like slow rolling boiling, not like a vigorous boil. So it's important to adjust temperature as you go along. Any words of encouragement to our viewers who are trying this for the first time? <laughs> you know, um, risotto is one of those things that, you know, you start to feel it. You start to, it's, it's again like if you make, yeah, if you cook pasta, you can keep on going back and tasting and tasting because you want it. You don't want to overcook it. You want it al dente or whatever. But um, you standing over the, the pot you, with risotto, I mean... It's really best not to move, go watch TV or whatever. You've got to be over the pot and watch it. Um, but don't be scared. I mean, the, the thing with the rice that you need to understand, it keeps on cooking. I mean, once you have liquid in there, the rice will keep on absorbing, so it will keep on cooking. It will go soft. Even the, the worst thing you can do is leave stock in your pot or in your pan in the rice and put it to one side because you're going to come back later for it. It's the rice are going to keep on absorbing that stock. So you have to stay with your pot or, or your pan 
stay with your rice, keep on stirring it, add the stock as you go, don't add too much, just enough, because you need to have control over how far you want to cook your rice. Okay, my rice is looking, it's looking groovy. <laughs> now, Ruben, you have been challenged by Karen Dudley and Franck Dangereau to see how quickly you can chop an onion. And now I know you've chopped one already for our recipe, and that was done very well, but today it is all about speed with this challenge. <laughs> Are you ready uh, to take you Cook's onion chop challenge? I've got to be ready, and I am ready. <laughs> Right, before we get started with the official onion chop challenge, Ruben, I think we've actually got a message for you, direct from Franck Donjeru. Are you ready to hear it? <laughs> yeah, let me hear that one. <laughs> Ruben and I have been in a, in a naked photo shoot together. So crying over an onion is going to be easy, bud. But good luck to you, 20 seconds. Now, a franc at a time of 20 seconds on the leaderboard. That's the time to beat. So, Ruben, my question to you is, are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Okay, I'm going to count you down from five. In five, four, three, two, one, chop. We're on 10 seconds, Ruben. Oh, no. Really? 15 seconds, it's all about speed. Wow, I wanted to get quality chopped onions here. Oh God. Just half an onion, is that fine? You got one half to go, Ruben. <laughs> oh, you were rushing Almost me, there. <laughs> And time. Uh, man. Ruben, you have a record time of 42 seconds. <laughs> Let's see what that looks like on the leaderboard. Oh, man. Okay. Frank's much older than me and he's done it for longer. So. <laughs> well, it looks like... Um, <laughs> Frank may still be in first place on the leaderboard. Um, we are ready for a very, very short break. So, Ruben, can you update us on, on what's happening with the risotto? Should we keep adding stock? Yeah, so this process will take sort of, um, you know, from start to finish between 15 and 20 minutes. So just follow um, the process of adding stock, uh, not too much, uh, allow it to absorb, and then keep on going. It should be perfect. And I'll show you towards the end how to finish it off. Keep your eye on your pan, and ladies and gentlemen, we will be back in just a minute.
Welcome back, everyone. So um, I've, I've added some more stock to my uh, risotto, so it's, it's coming along nicely. Um, I think I've got the temperature just right. I think it's one of those things that, you know, again, you're going to have to work at to make sure that your temperature is right. Otherwise, you're going to run out of stock. Or if it cooks too slowly, you're probably going to have too much stock because your rice will just sort of like uh, cook much quicker. Like I mentioned earlier, if it sort of lies in the stock and it's not cooking away, the rice will just absorb it so much quicker. Ruben, your, your onion challenge may have inspired some questions. Um, but before we get to those, I've got a question here asking, what are the three ingredients that you can't live without in your kitchen? Um, a good sort of whole peel tomatoes. Um, I've got to have uh, good Parmesan cheese. And I really like uh, pancetta. I mean, I'm a fan of that. And I think I can make a lot of dishes just using those three ingredients. Great. And in our, in our cook, -off, cook along this evening, how far along would you say we are at the moment? Well, I think we basically... Um, it was like three quarters of the way through the recipe. Wow. Um, you can see how the rice is now starting to cook nicely. Um, so I think it's about two or three more... Uh, ladles of the stock, and uh, then we should be finished. Uh, we have our beads going in the oven, so I'm going to check on them just now. And um, while that's happening, I'm going to start making my uh, bernoisette. I'm going to toast the nuts, and we're going to fry that sage, you know, one of my favorite additions to this recipe. Cool. I hope everyone's ready to make this incredible sage butter and walnut sauce at home. Um, we've got a comment here from um, a user or a cook at home who is saying, my husband and I had our first date six years ago this month at Ruben's in Franschhoek. We're now married three and a half years. Anything <laughs> you'd like to say, Ruben? Congratulations, you guys. I mean, uh, you know, for me, that's one of those special things that... Uh, that, that I sometimes bump into people like that. It, obviously, for me, it's so special when, I, when, people, when I'm in a position or a situation where people share those stories with me. So congrats to many more years, and I hope you're enjoying the cook-along uh, and that it comes out great. <laughs> How are we looking on the, risot uh, the risotto rice? Do you think it's time to perhaps start the sage butter? Yeah, so the butter goes on. I always say don't start with a hot pan. You want your pan, rather start with a cold pan because you want the, well, I'm going to do it with, the, start with the nuts. So you want to allow the, the nuts first to warm up and then they release some of the oil and then they start to toast. Just, it just works much better as what you add it into a sort of hot pan. So let me just get that going. So that just should take about uh, two to three minutes. Um, gives me enough time to just quickly check on my beets. I just need to add another ladle of the stock as well. So as you can see, you know, I'm stirring, I'm adding the stock, and I'm, I'm sort of like stirring as well as I go along. You don't want to overdo it, but you need to, especially once the stock sort of like uh, absorbs and evaporates, the, the bottom of the pan starts to get a bit more sticky, and that's, that's your cue for, for your next sort of addition of the stock. Okay, let's check on my beets. Yeah. How are they looking there? So this is... This is what they look like now. There's one or two of them that I really want to roast a little bit further. I'll give it another five minutes. For the chefs at home who are cooking their beets at the moment, what should they be looking out for to know that they're really good and done? Yeah, you, you just want them, you know, they start to bubble. They sort of start to bubble and uh, the skin starts to bubble. That's a good indication that the, the inside is shrinking a little bit, so they, they cooked. Um, and so a few of them are almost there. 
but there's some of them that still needs to sort of like come along a, a little bit more. So if yours are maybe sometimes your oven, uh, you know, that's the one thing also that we have. We have different types of ovens. So uh, uh, 200 degrees uh, Celsius with me might be slightly higher or lower, and that will affect how it cooks. So again, you got to, you know, most recipes, you got to watch what happens in front of you and react to that. Okay, so my walnuts starting to smell really nice. So I hope you've uh, measured out your butter uh, because I'm going to start adding my butter to to the nuts here. Let me just check the temperature. Yeah, it's good. I mean, this this is just one of my kind of <laughs> butter is really one of my favorite things too. I should have mentioned that earlier on, Nick. Um, <laughs> but again, it's one of those things that just really gives that richness of flavor to many dishes. Um, and I use that a lot too. I mean, I'm not shy to say that I use that from uh, breakfast in my oats a lot more than what I should. And uh, also nice in, in sort of like when you make sauces. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. And unsalted I use mostly. So would so, you say butter is the secret ingredient to good cooking? <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, um, Frank is a friend of mine, and I know he loves using butter. I mean, I, I really love it. It's, it's one of those things that doesn't just bring, again, mouthfeel, but lots of flavor. Okay, let me just... We're multitasking now, so there's a few things happening. I'm looking at my risotto. You can pull it to the side a little bit, too. The only thing you don't want is to overcook it. What I want is for it still to be moist by the time I'm, I'm going to add the cheeses. So I'll add a little bit more. It's pretty close now to being finished. And so when it comes to the bernoisette or the brown butter, um, as soon as it starts to get that kind of nutty smell, or you can see it starts to brown, then you need to know it's, it's close to being finished, so you've got to remove it at that stage, otherwise it just gets way too dark, and also it's not the flavor that we're after. So I'm adding the sage leaves to my pan, and then I'm just going to give it a nice toss as well. You don't need to do the shaking if you're not comfortable with that. Just stir it, okay? So what the warm butter will do, it will sort of crisp up the sage, like I mentioned earlier, and adds, it will add to the sort of like the, the, the textural element of this dish. And I think I'll take out my beets now. It should be done. See, they, they don't lose much of their color. That's the beauty of these uh, little rainbow beets. Uh, actually, what you'll see once we cut it open that the flavor just sort of, or the color just intensifies, as does the flavor. Ruben, we've got a question from a viewer who is having some technical difficulties saying their power went out at six and they're cooking on gas and trying to do the beets on the gas stove. Any pointers? Unfortunately, our oven is electric. Is that something you can do on the stove, beads? Um, I would say um, I would cut them. Cut them in half or even sort of quarter them uh, with a little bit of oil in your pan or your pot. And then uh, put them on a sort of like a lower setting uh, and put a lid on it in the beginning especially. And just allow them to kind of steam roast. You know, so steam will build up which will allow them to cook um, a bit quicker, but at the same time, they will, they will start to roast. Okay, so, I mean, the smell of sage and that walnut and the kind of brown butter, I mean, you know, when you work in a restaurant kitchen especially, these are the smells that you get all the time, you know, and this is one of those recipes, or burnt butter is, you, you, 
can only really make it fresh. And especially when you fry a sage, it's not one of those things that you can make and use tomorrow. You've got to make it and use it straight away. Okay, that smells great. So I'm going to put it to one side. Or I'm going to just switch off that flame. That's done. Perfect. So yeah, now uh, it's time to finish off our risotto. Um, as you can see, I mean, it's still nice and moist. The temperature is perfect. I'm going to add a little bit more of this stock. Not too much. Because what I'm after is I'm after sort of like this soft texture for the risotto. I don't want something that's stodgy. Could you describe the texture of the risotto at the moment for those at home who may be looking out to what to, what to look for? Um, you know, almost like if you make, if you're used to making something like oats, uh, porridge, or, you know, you want sort of, once you plate it onto your plate, it needs to fall nicely. I hate it when it just sits there, you know. A risotto needs to, once you plate it, it sort of like falls nicely onto your plate. That's the texture I'm after. Uh, so nothing stodgy. That's definitely what, not what I'm after. So that's doing well. Let me quickly cut the beets. So they're all kind of even sized, but there's a few of them that's bigger. So I'm going to cut them into quarters. And the smaller ones just sort of like in half. And they perfectly cook. They perfectly cook. And they, look at them. They look beautiful. Oh, yeah, that's the other thing. Rather, finish cutting your yellow ones and don't mix it. Otherwise, you're going to get that red color onto your, um, uh, the red color onto your yellow beads, and you don't want that. It won't change the flavor, just the look. That's a pro tip for everyone that's watching at home. <laughs> <laughs> look at these. I mean, these pink ones are just beautiful. Look at them. And the, the nice thing with these rainbow beads, they, they're great in salads as well, you know, so you can, you can uh, I've seen some people serving them like raw in salads, they're not nice, because the, when they're raw, they're slightly bitter, so give them a nice cook, you know, again, you can keep the skins on, and um, use them in your salads, you can still cut them, you know, you can maybe just boil them a little bit like that, just to soften them slightly, because that will bring out the sweetness. Okay, got a few more to go. I think my rice is calling for me to finish it off now. So we'll get there now. I mean, risotto, it is one of those things that, you know, you've got to go with the time of how it cooks. It can't wait for, for anyone. It's not one of those things that you can make, uh, keep and reheat. It won't work. So uh, let me just clean off my cutting board here. Got, got some gorgonzola. Just want to put this to one side as well. And then some of my parmesan. So there's still some sort of stock, and you can see the rice has sort of absorbed it. You know, this is the time when I'm very sort of specific of how the rice should come out. So I'm still going to add a little bit more. So you want the heat to be just right of your rice. Because the idea is, once you start adding the cheeses, um, that liquid starts to emulsify with your cheeses. And it gives you that nice sort of creamy texture, which is the mouthfeel we are after. We want that creaminess. Okay, so it's hot enough. When I add the cheese, I switch it off. So I'm going to switch it off. Parmesan. You know, a good sort of matured hard cheese uh, with, with your risotto is what really makes it. But on top of that, you can start to build with other cheeses. But, you know, 
for me as the default cheese, a good matured hard cheese, that's what you have to go for. Um, you can always add sort of, whether it's goat's cheese or in our case, we're gonna add this beautiful, I need a new knife, let's just, this beautiful gorgonzola, creamy gorgonzola, adding more creaminess. Ah, look at that. Okay, it's sticking to my fingers. <laughs> That's normal for gorgonzola, by the way. So, you see, now I just want to mix that in there. Are there any qualities about gorgonzola that, that really work with this dish and the other flavors and textures that you've mentioned? Yeah, I think it's, again, that um, kind of uh, that mature, creamy, blue cheese type of flavor that is kind of that traditional flavor that goes very well with nuts especially. I mean, yeah, we're using walnuts, which is for me one of the king of nuts. And we're using, um, serving that together with, with uh, beetroot, which is also, that's kind of like a classic combination, beetroot, gorgonzola, walnuts. We're just adding a great creamy risotto um, to just take it over the top in terms of flavor. Okay, so we're ready to dish up. Hope everyone at home has kept up, and if so, congratulations. We are now at the dish up stage. <laughs> so any tips on dishing up, Ruben? What should people do? What should people not do? So I'll show you. The idea for me is that a risotto, you know, try and not... Try not to mold it into any specific mold. If you have a nice bowl like this, I think it's perfect because you can just allow it to lie in there. And especially in our case when we're going to add the sort of butter to it. Um, so it has no other option than to mix sort of like with everything in there instead of plating it on sort of like a flat plate. Um, so yeah, um, don't try too hard to to make your plate look too contrived, you know, just rather go with sort of like a bowl and it's easy then to make it look pretty. Okay, so for me that's kind of like perfect, the texture, it's creamy. Um, the other thing is that's important in terms of when you see the texture is that the, that emulsion that we've created with the cheese and the stock and the starch that's in the rice, it sort of like sticks to the rice. It sticks to it. It doesn't sort of like lie in a source of the stock because that's when you know something went wrong. Maybe you added too much stock or your, your heat wasn't right. Okay. Again, let's start with the yellow ones. I mean, these colors are just absolutely extraordinary I together. I think they look, they look beautiful. I mean, look at these, again, these little pink ones. And again, I mean, for me, if it's got all that color, it means it's got flavor, you know? I mean, uh, um, and it's got that beautiful earthy sort of like taste as well, which is awesome. Okay. Um, this creamy blue... Uh, There. I mean, I know we've added blue cheese or gorgonzola to the recipe already, but I mean, what's wrong with adding more? You could never have too much cheese in a risotto, I always say. So that will just allow the gorgonzola to sort of melt into the rice and the beet. Ruben, you mentioned that a risotto is sort of like a vehicle or a carrier of flavor. Um, is there any other kind of risottos that, that, you, that you make with gorgonzola and these kind of ingredients? Or what, 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 would you, what else would you be cooking? Yeah, look, if you, I mean, this is a, a vegetarian dish, but obviously you can make it, you can, you can add other things to it. But if you, at the moment, like it is now, if you don't use beetroot, you can use butternut or pumpkin. I mean, imagine how great those flavors go together. Um, 
or just kind of like you can just keep it as a cheese and herb sort of like risotto with nuts. You don't need uh, the veggies. Um, so yeah, it's there's there's really many things you can do, especially when you use gorgonzola because that's already a flavor that stands out. Okay, here comes almost like the best part of it. It's adding this lovely burnt butter and the crispy sage. You can see how crispy they are. They, I mean, that's what you want. Um, and all that walnuts, you know, uh, I just love it when you have these dishes where it's texture, it's lots of flavor, it's creaminess, and we we basically enhance the flavor for me of sort of walnuts. I mean, it's already great, but if you do it this way, it almost, uh, the toasting takes away some of that slight bitterness that it normally has. Okay, and what I like to serve with my risotto, you know, earlier we rinsed our rocket and I'm serving it, I'm just dressing it basically with some olive oil. And this is uh, balsamic style vinegar from Willow Creek. It's the uh, Cabernet Sauvignon uh, vinegar and it's really, I mean, I use this a lot. And the cool thing about this vinegar, you can also cook with it, but it's got that nice sweet and sour that, again, it's just another addition of more flavor and the, the acidity of this will just cut through some of that sort of richness that we have in this risotto. It's quite a simple side salad. Is that the purpose of it? Just to not kind of overwhelm the other flavors? Yeah, we have texture. We have a lot of flavor in there already in our risotto. We, we just need maybe something uh, cleansing on the side to just go with it. Uh, so you don't need anything else. You don't need tomatoes. You don't need onions, nothing. The rocket, the, the pepperiness of the rocket just works perfectly with this risotto. So yeah, that's our uh, winter risotto with beetroot, gorgonzola, walnut, sage, brown butter, served with a rocket salad. It is all the good stuff. For those of you who are cooking at home, congratulations if you've completed the dish. And a big thank you for Ruben for walking us through it. Uh, before we get stuck in, Ruben, time for a few more questions from some of our viewers? Sure. Right, uh, we've got a question here. What wine would you pair with this kind of dish? Well, um, I think for something earthy like this, it also can go into different directions because you're having cheese and you have something you know, cheesy that's kind of rich. Um, I'll start with a white wine. I'll say a nice, uh, good uh, Chardonnay. Uh, uh, slightly wooded would work perfectly with this. Um, and then maybe a light type of, well, I don't want to say light, but a matured sort of Pinot Noir would be perfect with this as well. Another question coming through from Tom, who's asking, um, where will the funds from tonight's donations go and who will they help? Well, the idea is to assist uh, a lot of our, our staff that works um, at our restaurants. Um, these guys are sitting at home. Uh, so, you know, as far as possible, that we can help them and assist them in some way. I mean, there's different sort of avenues that we're using to assist them. Um, and yeah, it's basically going straight into helping our staff. And for those of you who are still watching um, and haven't gotten stuck into your risotto just yet, there will be a snap scan code at the end of the live cook along, um, as well as in your box and on our social media channels. I uh, got another question from Luke Rubin, if there's time. I um, want you to know, how many cookbooks have you released? So I've been lucky enough to have released four cookbooks. Um, and uh, I think the latest one we brought out about two years ago, almost now. Uh, so yeah, um, I'm really keen to do another one, but I, I think I'll wait a little bit longer for that. I, it's always these ideas that sort of like build up and then you want to sort of show people, uh, share, share it with people. But yeah. I enjoy that process as well, very much. Ruben, thank you so much for joining us this evening um, and thousands of chefs around South Africa cooking, guiding us, teaching us how to really, really master a risotto. Any last words you'd like to give to the audience? Any last pieces of advice? Let them know. Guys, all I can say is thank you again for joining us tonight. I really hope that you enjoyed it. 
that you got a few tips of how to really make it uh, make a risotto really properly and that you use that then to also attempt to make other types of risotto so that's the idea uh, but again I mean uh, I want to thank you cook and I want to thank you guys uh, also for uh, contributing towards just alleviating and making um, the lives of our staff just a little bit easier so thank you very much I, I appreciate it cool enjoy your risotto